So I'm Allison Ware. I'm a juvenile public defender. Um, I am an education attorney in our office, as well as handling summary non-traffic citations. Um, and I did a little bit of time in juvenile court. So a little bit of diverse um, things for me in the last couple of years. Um, but I'll let Christine introduce herself and then we can get started. Hi, everyone. I'm Christine Porter. I'm an education attorney with Allison in the juvenile um, division of the public defender's office. And we've had a team there for about two years, a little over two years now. Um, and we also have um, two wonderful education advocates who work with us on our team, um, one of whom is also, I think, on here tonight. So um, yeah, that's and that's what we do. We work with um, children and youth from 10 to 21. Yeah. Um, so we're going to get started. Our experience, like Christina said, is specific to Allegheny County, but most of what we're sharing, we believe applies all across the state. So um, hopefully we can at least shed some light and some new information. Um, so we just have a quick... Hmm. Okay. Um, so we have a quick agenda slide, um, just the sort of main points that we'll be touching on tonight. Um, sort of the three ways that your child could enter the juvenile justice system. So community interaction with police, if they're walking down the street, just in the neighborhood at the store, um, interactions with police that way, um, a school incident or school discipline, school behavior, um, and summary citations, which are the non-traffic citations that I touched on in the beginning. We'll touch more on those as we go through. So police encounters, um, these are like community encounters. Um, we recommend that your child, so if your child is approached by a police officer and they say, may I search you? May I look in your bag? The general answer that we tell kids to respond with is no, thank you. <laughs> um, you just never really know where it's headed. It can be sensory triggering to them. Oh, I'm sorry. It can be sensory triggering to them. It can just involve some stuff that they're not familiar with, not comfortable with, um, and it can lead to sort of a more triggering encounter than, than they may already be in. Um, they also don't need to offer anything more than their name, their date of birth, and then a parent's name or phone number. Um, so that's the only information that they have to give. It's the only information that if you're helping to teach your child or prepare your child what they may need to provide in those situations, um, that's as much as they have to give. Go ahead, Christine. Oh, yeah. yeah, so just like Allison, I think this, um, Allison was saying this slide um, talks about police stops. So um, you don't have to consent to a search. And I think that's, you know, something we would recommend. Um, but it also, if, if you say, if the, your child says no, um, we would also say, tell your child not to fight if then um, the police do go ahead and search anyway. So, you know, that's something that, potentially suppressing anything that is found in that search after the child didn't consent is something that an attorney could work on with the child later. But, and then this is um, the same information, name, date of birth, parent's name and phone number. Um, you could say your school or your address. Uh, the, um, we do have a legal right to record police in public. Um, and, you know, but, you want to make sure not to run from the police. And that's something to tell our children as well. Um, okay, so should your child be um, invited into an interrogation room um, or you receive, these are what interrogation rooms look like. This is like a real picture um, and they can often be tight and cramped and for our kids with sensory issues and difficulties, it is really overstimulating and it's tight and it's often cold or hot and it presents all of these sort of extra triggering factors. Um, we often recommend to, in basically we go with a probably never um, for having your child speak to the police. Um, usually when the police wanna to talk to your child, it is a scenario where it, <laughs> In most circumstances, it leads to more harm than good, right? There, there's a question about, were you involved? Did you participate? Um, what do you know about this case? Now, if your child is just a, a true, true victim, 
Um, we're not saying that they shouldn't report that or, or take care of that matter, um, but those circumstances are more rare than um, general scenarios. So between the sensory need that is induced by the space of the room, um, as well as sort of the intention that usually comes with an interrogation, um, we usually recommend to not consent to those. Um, and we're happy to, you know, if you call an attorney and, and you consult them, they will likely tell you the same. Um, and that attorney can sometimes reach out to the officers themselves and say, thank you for contacting my client. I represent them. I've advised them not to speak. Um, and then that sort of clears up that issue. Um, so police interrogations just continued. Um, you have the right to remain silent. You have the right to an attorney if you're being interrogated. Um, Children should always have the chance to consult with an interested adult. So whether that's mom, dad, grandma, um, whoever the person is that is invested in them, interested in them, it's usually who's raising them, but not always. Um, we listed just a couple of, of little key phrases that we give to both adults and children. Um, I do not wish to speak to you. I want a lawyer. Um, basically a no thank you, um, but you have to make clear that you don't intend to speak. So um, only you have to be 10 in Pennsylvania uh, to be arrested. The juvenile court doesn't have um, jurisdiction if you're under 10. So the um, 10 and then it goes up to 21. The, if you're, and if we want to add more to that, the ages, but um, if you're, the court can have jurisdiction over a child up to the age of 21, but it's if the incident happened um, before 18. So uh, Act 33 is on here. So that's a direct file. So for some very, very serious um, charges, um, violent felonies, children can be charged as adults, right? So directly filed, uh, they call it direct file, and it's, they're charged as adults, um, and they go through adult court, um, just like an adult would, even though they can be 15, 16 years old. So um, just on here again, I want a lawyer. That's the words to, that we recommend our clients use. We teach um, The teacher children say, to say, I want a lawyer if they are being questioned. And then we also do recommend that um, in most circumstances, clients, um, our clients or your children would inform the police of any disability or you inform the police of a child's disability as a parent or caregiver. Um, so we added in here, we're trying to go in like six, sort of the order in which these things could happen. Um, we just wanted to put in a slide on parents calling police. Um, we know that when your child is in a mental health crisis or having a really explosive, difficult behavior, um, sometimes the police feel like the right place to go. They feel like all that is left. Um, we just advise you to be careful. We have a number of clients who were in a mental health crisis, whose parents just really needed assistance. They really needed help. And they, they called the police and now their child is charged mm -hmm. um, with disorderly conduct, with aggravated assault because they put their hands on the police officer or on a parent or um, we recommend trying things like resolve or 211 through caring connections. Um, we just recommend trying those first. And we do understand that you know, we're not there, right? So we, while we understand and we, we've we been there, um, we're not in your shoes. So just be careful about it and use it as an absolute last resort. Um, there's this myth that children within the court system have access to more services or better services or shorter wait lists. Um, and that's, that's not true. Um, all of the services that our kids have access to in the juvenile justice system are absolutely afraid available to private entities. You can sign your child up just as our kids probation officer signed them up. Um, so we always recommend that route and that there is no extra service that can be offered. Yeah. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Did you wanna go back to that slide? 
No, no. I just think, I think that's um, really important. Yeah. I had a, a parent tell me um, months into the, the child had been in juvenile court for months and parents told me, I wish I'd never called the police. Right. My, my child hit me. I was advised to call the police. Um, actually, it, I believe it was child welfare that suggested this parent call the police and said, I wish I'd never done it um, because it is just because you lose control. Right. As a parent or a guardian, like once your child is involved in the juvenile justice system, you you lose control over what's happening with your own child. Um, Oh, that's a great, okay, so uh, Christina adds, um, my parent alliance adds, you can also try calling 988, the new mental health emergency number. It's a really good idea. I don't know, and I would you know, love to hear more experiences with that if, if anyone has had um, positive experiences. So, um, yeah, do you wanna talk about what happens if you're detained, Allison? Yeah, so, if your child is detained, so that means they are arrested and they are held in a juvenile detention facility rather than being released to you, um, they will have a detention hearing within 72 hours. So in Allegheny County, they are held Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Um, so always within that 72 hour period, no matter when your child would get arrested and detained, there is a detention hearing. Um, our office, specifically in Allegheny County, has an attorney that represents every child at a detention hearing unless they bring their own attorney. Um, so your child will be represented at that is in our county specifically. Um, I would imagine it is more common throughout the state to also have an attorney at those. Um, you're entitled to one. Um, so I can just speak to how we do it. Sometimes children are released on electronic home monitoring. Um, the electronic monitors are about as big as my phone. Like they're they're, they're big they're huge yeah um they're really like clunky on the kids ankles especially like little skinny kids um they like buy bigger pants it's like sort of a big big mm -hmm. surface for them um especially coming into summer kids get really upset to be on it because they want to wear shorts um but yeah so within 72 hours your child will have a detention hearing um and then that judge will decide whether or not they are released to you or whether or not within another 10 days they will have a hearing so if if the child remains detained within every 10 days, they have to have a hearing. We can't just keep them detained for a month, two months, three months while we, we work on their case. Um, so working with defense attorneys, um, should you find yourself in this position, should your child have a defense attorney? It is so, so helpful when we get as many documents as we can about a child, as yeah. much information as you can provide. Um, Every detail. I, I talk to parents every day and I know my colleagues do too, who say there's a parent that'll say, I don't know if this is important. I don't want to bore you with it or waste your time. Mm -hmm. You're not wasting my time. I'm working with your child. I want to help them as best I can. Every detail you can give me about them is important. So any documents that you have about your child's diagnoses, medical reports, their IEP, anything like that is super helpful. Um, and it also goes to the question of competency. Does your child understand the legal process? Is your child able to help us in their own defense? Is your child able to understand the difference between a plea deal and going to trial? Does your child understand why their conduct was wrong or inappropriate? Um, all of these things play into whether or not they're competent. And if they're not competent to stand trial, um, we wanna make sure that we get an evaluation about that as fast as we can um, so that your child is, is protected and that we're not going to trial or having them enter pleas if they don't um, fully comprehend what's going on. Um, Christina, anything you want to add about that? No, I think I think you're absolutely right though, as, as much as we can get, um, you know, yeah. school records, relevant medical records, like anything mm -hmm. that parents have can be really helpful. Um, so court processes and hearings, um, these are, we can just touch on these briefly. Um, if you're ever in this position, you'll have a lawyer. Um, so adjudication is two steps. That means both, the first step is there was a finding of fact, which means they did the thing. Because I explain it to kids, was it you? 
And can they prove that it was you that did the thing that they're saying happened? The second is, are they in need of treatment, rehabilitation, and supervision? So that's just, does a child have needs that the juvenile justice system would like to address? Are, are they using drugs or alcohol? Do they need therapy? Do they need any of those sort of things gets addressed at that stage? Oh, yeah. I just, I wanted to add one thing, Allison, yeah. on that. Um, so sometimes we get calls from parents um, who, so the client is for us is the child. And sometimes we get calls from parents who um, are a little upset that we want to speak with their child, but that's something that we ethically have to do if the, the child is able to communicate with us. Like we need to communicate with that child and we will also talk to the parent, right? But um, that's just something to know about juvenile public defenders that ethically um, that's our client is, is the child. Yeah, no, that's a great point. I'm glad that you had that. Um, we usually will take time, at least the way that I practice specifically, I know a lot of my colleagues do it similarly, is I'm happy to talk with the parent and child together so that we can work through it. We know that your children don't make a lot of decisions without you, um, that they need you and that you're part of the decision-making process. Um, we ethically, in order to keep our license and continue to work, do have to talk with your kids separately um, for a little bit of time. And it is just to make sure that that our bases are covered there and that they've had the free and full opportunity to ask us questions. And and one time I had a kid who I always say to kids, if there's anything you were embarrassed to ask me about this case in front of your mom or dad, let me know. Mm -hmm. um, and I had one kid who said, I'm embarrassed because my mom told me that I had to wear a belt to school. And if I had worn a belt, then when I was running, I probably wouldn't have gotten caught. And I said, <laughs> Okay, thanks for sharing. Um, and so that's just sort of what's happening in those little conversations. I think as a parent, it can feel nerve wracking and sort of what's happening back there. Um, I had a little boy just confess to me that he, he should have been wearing a belt that day. So it, it's it's not as um, sort of secretive and, and difficult as it may seem. Um, okay, school referrals um, to police and school discipline. Christine, you want to talk about suspensions and expulsion? Sure. So we'll just really quickly talk about this. We see a lot of um, suspensions, expulsions, and then charges for the same incidents um, that the children were suspended or expelled for. So kind of this double punishment. Um, so suspensions in Pennsylvania, um, as many of you know, at one to 10 days, um, you're supposed to have it, you required to have an informal suspension hearing after the third day. Um, you have the right to question witnesses and see evidence. And if this is something that the child might be charged for, it's really important to get that evidence and to um, find out who these witnesses are. Um, we want to also be really careful if we do have these, um, if we do have these hearings, these informal suspension hearings, um, or if, and I think that might be slide later about this, but of manifestation determination review. Mm -hmm want to be really careful if charges are coming that the child isn't questioned at these, right? That there isn't any, um, um, there aren't questions uh, at these where the child is is um, making an admission uh, or trying to explain their side of the story, right? So that's something that we would, we would really um, advise against. Yeah. There's in, a in most cases. Yeah. 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 So that's, and that's something for, yeah, an expulsion hearing is the same thing. It, it can be a little trickier there, but, um, you know, can consult with an attorney. I would definitely recommend consulting with an attorney for an expulsion hearing, especially if they're going to be charges for the same incident. And often we do see charges for an incident um, when kids are expelled. So a manifestation determination, you can just remembering that you can still have one. You don't have to the kid doesn't have to say, you know, this is what happened, right? Um, you can do it as a kind of hypothetical, like, okay, let's say this version is what happened, then would that be a manifestation of a disability? Um, so, and just being really careful about statements made by students in those hearings, because they have the right not to incriminate themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So to piggyback off on manifestation determinations, um, it's not the intent of the child and it's not, did the child know right from wrong? Um, 
was the behavior directly related to the disability um, or was the IEP followed? So um, like Christine said, I, I've gone to both manifest, we both gone to manifestation determination meetings and informal hearings. Um, and I told a child that he was not allowed to answer any questions about the incidents, just like Christine was saying, we're not going to talk about that incident. Um, the school has their version of facts and they said that charges were coming. So he wasn't going to speak on that. Um, and when the first question that the superintendent asked him was, how long have you gone to the school? And he looked at me and he said, can I answer that? I said, yes, absolutely. Um, that's not related to your, to your charges. Um, how long you've gone here is totally acceptable. Um, and every district does it a little bit differently. Um, uh, so it all depends on the district and how much they want to know and how much they already are familiar with your child. Um, but our biggest advice for manifestation, I think, is do it as a hypothetical. Let's say you're, you know, say to the school, let's say your facts are as exactly as it happened. We're not agreeing with that, but let's say that's true. Then would that have been a manifestation? Um, because often our kids' stories are maybe not as elaborate as the school. So our, our kids' version feels better, like a better version to them. Um, so if we start with the school's version and they say, yes, it's a manifestation, then all the way down to um, the bottom would also be. Um, I think oh. this is this. Oh, sorry. Yeah. No, this yeah. Is you know, if charges are coming, um, um, continue it as a hypothetical. Um, and courts are not appropriate for addressing special education issues. So yeah. if there's a problem in the classroom, your child's not receiving proper support, and then they get charged. It's really important to come to court and make sure that the lawyer knows um, sort of what's going on in the school and that this is a school issue. This has resulted to charging potentially because everybody's frustrated, potentially because everybody doesn't know which way to turn, but it's a, it's something that definitely needs addressed um, in the IEP and maintained within the school setting. Um, Christine, did I miss anything on this? No, no, I think okay. maybe the next slide, because I was going to say yeah. more about that. Um, yeah, so here it's important to get copies of any, you know, manifestation determination, worksheets, or if there's a functional behavior assessment done after the incident. Um, Sometimes those school records will have information or you'll be in a meeting. Everyone will say, we understand this is a manifestation of disability. Um, you know, here's what we think happened. And, and then you'll have some documentation of that. And sometimes that'll be inconsistent with the information that later shows up in a police report or that's, you know, given in court. So I think it's really important to get all that information. Um, yeah, I mean, this was a situation these were um, a situation where the child in court, the the story in court was different from the story that was what was on the school documents. I'm sorry about the picture. This might be triggering for yeah. some people, but um, this is a, we just want to make sure that, so restraint is of course a, a serious problem and overuse of restraint, um, a serious problem in schools. And we do see some charges coming out of um, restraint situations sometimes, right? Aggravated mm -hmm. assault charges. Um, it's also a problem in our juvenile placements. So yeah. so just make sure your child has an IEP meeting after they're happening. If they're repeatedly happening, yeah, make sure there's further action. Yeah. Um, um, and the same, yeah, after referrals to police, um, there are some steps to, that schools are supposed to take, right? Doing an updated FBA. Um, sometimes this doesn't happen, but it really should. And it's critically important, I think, so. Yeah. Uh, okay, so we are on to summary citations. I'm sorry, I know we're going really fast. Um, we're trying to give everybody like a broad overview and leave, leave room for questions and time, um, but we can appreciate that we're going pretty quickly. So don't panic, <laughs> we have time. Um, so what if your child receives a summary citation? So summary citations are non-traffic. So I explain them um, sort of on a ladder system. Um, your highest charge would be a, a murder or a homicide, um, followed then by charges like robbery, aggravated assault, or you know, all the way down the ladder to the lowest being a speeding ticket. 
Um, and non-traffic citations are the level of a speeding ticket. Um, so they are the lowest level of offense, but still not great for children um, and not great, especially to our children with behavioral and mental health needs. Um, so just a couple of sort of things to walk through should your child be in that position. Um, do not confess to the school or to the police. The number of cases that I have currently on my caseload where the child, you know, two kids fight at school, they're pushing and shoving. Um, and I say, did you say anything to the principal? And they say, yeah, we walked into the principal's office and I wrote down that she threw my book bag and then I plunged her in the face. I'm like, okay, well, that wasn't perfect. <laughs> um, so you don't have to, you know, it's the same as an arrest for any other sort of crime. You don't have to say anything. Um, this citation will come in the mail. It comes on, at least in Allegheny County, they're like little yellow colored pieces of paper. Um, it, it'll look like a traffic ticket if you've ever gotten one. Um, your local magistrate will hear these cases. So it will not be in the juvenile court building. Um, it will be heard by the local magistrate. So at least in Allegheny County, it is the magistrate where the incident occurred. Um, I know in some smaller smaller counties and smaller districts, there is like a magistrate or two magistrates um, that sort of handle these. So depending on your area will depend on how that goes. Um, at those hearings, feel free to share and, and empowered to share your child's diagnoses, any therapy or support that are already in place. Um, I had a hearing last week for a child who was in an autism support classroom. He had some difficulty with the teacher. There was a citation filed. Um, and we came to court with his IEP, with letters from all of his supports, from his TSS, from his therapists, sort of all of the wraparound services this child already had. And we were able to tell the judge, judge, this is an IEP issue. This is not, you know, and this child is not lacking support. This child has tons of support. Um, and that was really helpful in the judge understanding what was going on and and being able to ultimately dismiss the citation, but also many magistrates, at least in our area, worry, does this child need a service that they don't yet have? And if you're able to come and say, my child is so well supported, there's nothing this child needs, that's an extra um, sort of notch for you. Uh, the most common examples are disorderly conduct, harassment, retail theft, criminal mischief, and truancy. Um, the way that I explain summaries to children and how we're going to handle them are either there are two choices. The first is it wasn't me, they got the wrong person. The second is it maybe was me, here's why, and here's why I won't do it again. Um, and most summaries fall into the second category um, for kids. So this is just an example um, of a summary citation. This was a 10 year old little boy. Um, he was charged with spraying silly string on his neighbor's car. Um, he and some friends were playing in the neighborhood. One child sprayed the silly string, the other child ran. So therefore the silly string missed the child, hit the car. Um, my client walked, he ran home. He said, mom, I got silly string on you know, the neighbor's car. She gave him a bucket of sponge. He came outside, the police were already standing there. He dropped it in the street, it was a big. Um, sort of to do and and the woman's car was not damaged it was it wiped right off um, but he had to come to court and and talk about that and he was 10 so and I can say that this child this was his only interaction with the justice system um, this case was ultimately dismissed they had no further issues with the neighbor you know the judge said if you have no further issues with this neighbor I will dismiss it and I said judge they haven't had an issue yet you know, this wasn't an issue. This was kids playing. Um, and I haven't seen this child again. So it, this was almost two years ago and he's just still out there being a kid. Um, so. Christine, do you want to add any tips? Um, I just, I want to say to you, I don't know if, if you mentioned this, Allison, but we have a special grant to provide summary representation and summaries to juveniles, right? So mm -hmm. most places in this state, I don't believe have this. Am I right about that, Allison? I think that's true. I, well, I'm not aware of any other in Pennsylvania that do, but if they do, I would love to know who they are and connect with them. 
Yeah. Um, but we are, the, we are the only ones that I know in the state. But if you're somewhere else in the state, and if you have a question, we're always happy. We have our contact information at the end and we're always happy to, you know, talk to you and, and try to walk you through this. Yes, absolutely. Um, I, I agree. I think, I think a lot of this goes across the board. Um, one is always plead not guilty. So in, especially in adult cases or in, you know, if you get a speeding ticket, I always use that example because that's my personal problem. Um, if you get a speeding ticket and the officer says, well, if you plead guilty to going five over, you won't have to pay the fine for going 12 over. Um, non-traffics for children are not like that. This is the highest and the worst that it can be of this particular type of charge. So there's nothing lower and it's in the wrong court to go higher. So your child should always plead not guilty. Um, and in many cases, we have judges who will say, you know, if your child just had a bad day and just fought another kid, you know, let's say there's no good reason. They don't have supports. There's just, just a bad day. Um, judges will say, if you give me 10 hours of community service and, and 60 days of no more trouble, I'll dismiss it. Um, there's a lot of magistrates that we've had come around since our project has started to, to really, I think, grasping how these long-term affect children and about how they make them feel like there's already something on my record. So now it doesn't matter. And, mm -hmm. and giving an opportunity for them to go away. Ultimately, um, do not pay the fine listed on the citation. That is not the final fine. It is just these numbers that ride along the side. Um, and so parents will plead guilty with their child and say, yeah, I did silly string the woman's car. They plead guilty. They pay the $40 listed on the side. Um, and then they get a bill in the mail for $350 and they don't know why, and they don't know where it came from and don't pay the fine listed on the side, <laughs> just plead not guilty. Um, and they'll schedule you a hearing. Um, what's really important to know going into these hearings, your child cannot be placed on probation. They cannot be detained. They cannot be sent to a juvenile placement. I always tell kids they will go, you will go home with your mom and dad today. Um, no matter what happens, you're going to go home with them. It's going to be okay. Um, and you always have a right to appeal within 30 days. So there's nothing that happens at the magistrate for kids that can't be undone. Um, it, you always get another chance. Um, and so that is, at least for me, and especially when I started a very reassuring fact that if this goes really poorly, if the judge is in a bad mood, if I say all the wrong things, if, if my kid decides to flip over the table in the courtroom and run out, we always get another chance. 